architectural education is important, it's precious, it's special, it's under attack, and we have to start the fight back. Business of Architecture UK, episode 43. Hello and welcome to the Business of Architecture UK. I am your host, Ryan Willard. And before we go into this week's interview, of course, very special announcement. We are having our next BOA UK live event on the seven threats to an architecture business, which will be held at you and I offices in 7A Hoek Place. That's in Victoria. It's going to be Tuesday night. There's going to be networking. There's going to be drinks. There's going to be nibbles. And there's going to be a discussion panel with, we've got David West of Egray West. We've got Hazel Rounding of Shed. We've got Tim Burgess of Cove Burgess Architects. Um, we've got Tara Boladay of the Boladay Studio and Johan Taft of Magnify Your Grace Greatness. And they are going to be discussing the seven threats to an architecture business. Now, if you've been following me on the uh, email list, I have already revealed the first three of those seven threats. We've got cash flow as one, we've got lack of resource as number two, and we've got number three, no market need. And if you want to find out the rest of those go and sign up to the email list or come to the event because the discussion panel will be talking about how they have grown their businesses and practices to avoid those seven threats. It's going to be a fantastic evening and I look forward to seeing you there. So click in the link below and you can buy your tickets now. Right. On to this week's interview. I had the great pleasure of going to the Royal College of Art next door to the Royal Albert Hall in the beautiful um, South Kensington area of London and I spoke with Phineas Harper. Now, Finn is a critic, a designer, he's based in London, he's the deputy director of the Think Tank, the Architecture Foundation, and he's the chief curator of the 2019 Oslo Architecture Triennale, who he's doing that with in Terrabang, and uh, Cecile Sachs Olsen. He also writes, um, he's quite a prolific writer, he writes for Dazine, um, as well as other magazines, and This interview kind of happened quite organically, actually. Now, Finn is a fascinating uh, character and a real advocate for young architects and the next generation of architecture and a real advocate for tertiary education and architectural education. And normally, when I'm setting up for a podcast, I ask the question to the person who's about to be interviewed, where did you go to school? Um, And can you tell me one of your most memorable moments at school? And I really use that question just as a way for people to talk naturally and for me to uh, test the sound to make sure that I get the balances right. And when Finn started speaking, he told me about his schooling experience of being homeschooled and it began to paint a very fascinating picture of self-inquiry and it kind of linked into a number of themes about architectural education and the sort of self-directed nature of architecture and how at the heart of architectural education can be this kind of, um, you know, finding your own talents, um, you know, mindset, which also is very, very deeply related to running a business and entrepreneurship. So the conversation kind of grew organically from that question. So without further ado, I'm going to leave you with the wonderful Finn Harper. So you were saying that you were home, you were homeschooled, yeah. you were home educated. And whereabouts was that? I uh, grew up in the Midlands, in the West Midlands, yeah. so sort of s- north of Oxford, south of Birmingham. Uh, uh, it's a kind of flat-ish, hilly bit of, uh, of England. Amazing. And, and so what would you say were the, some of the benefits of being homeschooled? Uh, well, it's, it's slightly hard to know because I didn't go to school, so it's hard to kind of compare. But uh, when, you, 
when you go to school, you're kind of forced through this kind of industrial batch production system. Mm. And that inevitably means certain um, compromises have to be made. And it's very hard to uh, really give a, an entire classroom full of kids um, the freedom to learn in a in a kind of uh, in a chaotic or a um, adventurous or um, uh, an, a kind of improvised way, um, you have to kind of get a certain amount of stuff just stuff done in the day, and that sort of forces um, this quite strict curriculum. And you know, some countries are better at this than other countries, and I think the British system is particularly industrial, possibly because we are the home of industry and kind of the industrial revolution came from here and you can see its imprint on um, schools. And, you know, Ken Robinson talks about if you think of a school as a factory, which has um, specialisms and it has, um, it is organized by kind of zones and it has bells to indicate the start and the end of the working day. Mm. Um, and children are produced um, in, in these kind of batches that are organized by age Right? Why is age a good way to organize learning? It doesn't, doesn't actually, it's not actually intuitive. Like if you were thinking about people you were going to invite to your wedding, you probably wouldn't think like, well, they all need to be the same age and that's really important. You'd be thinking, well, what are their relationships to me? What are their relationships to each other? How do they work as this kind of gang that has meaning in my life? Um, and yet, for some reason, with schools, we're so used to this idea that, oh, well, they, they all have to have been born between September 2008 and September 2009, that it just seems like second nature. So home education allows you to kind of dump all of the preconceptions of what a school building is for and to kind of invent it from scratch and to mm -hmm. kind of keep inventing it. You don't. You, my, well, I was taught by my parents and they, they would kind of come up with wacky experiments and some of them would work and some of them wouldn't work and you know some of them were more orthodox um i can remember building like an egyptian irrigation system um at the like stream near my house and this was on the one hand a, a kind of fairly straightforward way of learning about how ancient egyptians watered plants using the nile but on the other hand taught you a little bit about mechanics and how a tripod works um and how like a lever works uh, it was a kind of making thing. So, you're, you know, you're using your hands and you're learning to be dexterous and you're learning how mm. to sort of tie knots. Um, and it was a lot of fun, like, you know, messing around in a, a river for a day. Whereas if you were doing this in school, like, that, that kind of wouldn't have been possible or would have been like a very exceptional trip that would have had to been risk assessed and so on. <laughs> so... Um, it makes it very hard for a teacher to deliver anything like that. Yeah. Um, and you have to kind of identify learning outcomes. One of the, the, the like key differences, and this maybe brings us a little bit into architectural education, is it is really hard to define what you're going to learn before you learn it, because human brains don't work like that. It's like going into a relationship and being able to describe what you're going to get out of that relationship before you know how long it's going to last, before you really know what the person is like, before you know like what you want from the relationship. It's just, it's a kind of nonsense, mm. but we've got used to this idea that good teachers are teachers who can sort of describe a learning outcome and then deliver that like it's a kind of package service. And um, I think it's quite exciting that actually humans don't really work like this. We, we tend to learn in this quite kind of bizarre, organic, unpredictable way. Um, and schools just aren't really equipped to like consider the possibility of that or to like, how do you, how do you make a curriculum that um, kind of enfranchises that understanding mm. of learning? Or how do you um, make sure that the resources in a time of austerity are like appropriately allocated to um, facilitate this chaotic learning? Uh, whereas home education, you sort of don't have any of those, or you, or you have fewer of those pressures, and you can kind of take a few more risks. So I guess the best thing about home education to kind of come back to your <laughs> question a long time ago was like it allows pedagogical risks it mm. allows you to invent how you learn it allows you to experiment 
um, and you're not forced through this kind of one-size-fits-all straight jacket that is what not all schools, but what a lot of schools are like. Yeah, and it allows you to kind of get in touch with what you are about as a person and how you work and how you operate. And I think, you know, why I, I found this question so fascinating is, I mean, one of my sort of thoughts a lot about uh, business and entrepreneurship um, is that many people who are very successful in business or entrepreneurship have come not out of schooling systems um, and our long sort of architectural education, again, is a, is a product of industrialised education. Um, and so, and, and often the whole system that we, we go through is really geared towards us fitting into a predefined position, um, which would have been great advice in the 1950s, I think. Uh, I think that was, I think, I think that was, that was great, it, that would have worked. But nowadays in 2019, it's causing all sorts of difficulties. And in the architectural profession uh, as well, this kind of, you know, our training kind of is really gearing us towards working for somebody else or, or, or going into a kind of uh, a system in many ways. And actually, the natural way of thinking or the natural sort of architectural mode of thinking is kind of outside that as well. And it's kind of much more akin to this um, self-directed learning. Yeah, I mean, I, I'm a fan of architectural education compared to other forms of higher mm. education. I think that um, if, if you think about, I don't know, let's take a random subject, economics. Economics is taught through lectures, occasional seminars, which are just smaller lectures uh, and a bit more discursive, and then lots and lots of reading and some maths. Um, it's, it's not a particularly diverse set of stimuli that you get as a student and uh, the experience of being a student on an economics course largely is turning up to huge lectures and then reading alone in your room with the occasional tutorial whereas architectural education is so much richer like even a rubbish school will be taking students on field trips to other countries will be um, making students work with like different materials with their hands with m making models making drawings both by computer and by hand there seems to be a really um, rich culture of uh, practicing architects teaching in schools, which you just don't see in other professions. Um, you know, when we've organized Megacrits at the Architecture Foundation, um, you sometimes have a student who, I don't know, let's say they're, they're doing their entire thesis project is on the work of Kate McIntosh. And Kate McIntosh turns up to give them a crit. It's like, where, where else would you, would you get that level of access to be able to have a conversation with a kind of leading industry figure? Um, so I think there are some fantastic things about architectural education. Mm -hmm. Just the fact that you're not just stuck in your room or stuck in a lecture theater, that there's this whole third space of the studio um, is amazingly precious and that we shouldn't fall into the trap um, of slagging off schools and tutors and, and, uh, and students um, more than they deserve because I think that there's a lot of things we've, we've got that actually we need to fight for. You know, schools are under pressure to make cuts. They're under pressure to shrink their space consumption. And um, if it is seen that the architectural profession doesn't support architectural pedagogy mm. then there's a real risk that actually we lose some of those those key those key um, resources having said all of that uh, it is certainly true that there is a kind of um, mold that some kind of architectural teachers have in mind when they're training their students um, and the point the, for some people the point of this very rich education is to produce kind of oven ready <laughs> Um, part one, part two, part three, uh, architect fodder for for the big practices. Um, I think that the, there's 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 schools where that is more or or, or less of a problem, um, and like we should be critical of of that as well. Um, but I do think there's there's a lot to be said for architectural education. Certainly, an architecture school is better than the way that um, most kids are taught in primary school. Mm. I think. And, 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 of, and of course, Mr. the complexity of architecture education is it's such a broad subject. And I mean, I, I, mean, I know from my, my own experience of 
being at the Bartlett, that we were given the opportunity to explore subjects and topics that were so wildly or tenuously related to architecture, but in but given a certain way of looking at the world, and you're given a set of tools to learn how to connect different ideas up, that in itself is such a precious uh, set of skills to be engaged in. And so it's, I mean, I, it, it is, I do mean, I speak to a lot of architects and some complain about the education being too long. I'm critical of it being too long in many, in many aspects. And also this, this, uh, this disjunct, this kind of conflict between practice and education. And I think what you've just said is incredibly pertinent about the, pract the profession needs to be seen to be supporting education. Um, yeah. Which they often don't. Like architects love to slag off architecture schools and architecture students. Yeah. Um, and I understand why they're doing that. They're doing it because they feel under right. Architects feel like they are losing authority. They are losing power. Um, they are kind of lashing out, and they blame the RBA, or they blame the government, or they blame architectural schools. And uh, I think it's a mistake. I think that architects need to. Um, not try and blame the schools, who are frankly like the the kind of, to some extent, the least empowered people to actually make a change, um, and to try and make the change within the industry itself. Mm. And there are there are a few things we could kind of talk about that speak to that. But for example, um, race and diversity have become rightly crucial topics in architectural discourse at the moment, um, and a lot of people point to architectural schools and they say, you know, architectural schools are not doing enough to widen access to a broader range of people. Actually, the number of BAM, BAME people going into architectural education is huge. It's much, much bigger as a kind of proportion of the overall student body than BAME people are as a proportion of the UK population as a whole. So in a way, architectural education is doing a much better job of attracting people from diverse backgrounds than practices. Because once you get to practice, and you know, uh, particularly senior roles it, within practices, suddenly that diversity drops away. Um, now, I'm not arguing that schools couldn't do more, particularly to retain um, diverse student populations who often kind of drop out at a disproportionately high rate. But I think it's a real misunderstanding of just the data to try and say that architectural schools are like the source of white privilege in the profession. Actually, it's the profession itself. It's the, it's the kind of, it's the companies, it's the businesses, it's the practices who are the ones who are kind of letting the side down. And to try and blame, to blame someone else is, is disappointing. And so I will always try and call them out uh, when they do that. And I think that, that you can sort of see that kind of pattern happening again and again. Um, not even in architecture, like, there's just a tendency for like, old people to blame young people for stuff in general. And you, know, you see, like, to take a very, very like, macro-political view, over-consuming Westerners blaming population growth for climate change rather than blaming their ludicrously consumer-based lifestyle where they have... Um, you know, they're flying around the world to give lectures, they're eating in a way that's bad for the environment, they're heating their homes with their single glazing listed <laughs> um, um, windows or whatever. Uh, rather, and, and yet they, they say, well, the real problem is like Indian people are just breeding too fast. And this is such a, um, a ridiculous um, analysis of what is going on and like why we have climate change. Um, and it's partly like willful denial and people just don't want to take responsibility for like the power that they have and the power to make change. Uh, and it's partly just easier to try and blame someone else. Mm. And, 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 and so what, what is the responsibility that you think the profession should be taking in terms of education? What kind of roles can the profession be, you know, how? How can, how can the profession and practices be engaging more with the education and the cultivation of the next generation of architects? 
All right. Okay. So, what what can what can what can practices do to support? Well, I think one thing is that we have to get behind higher education in architecture. We have to stop this um, bitching and sniping thing and recognize that higher education is under threat. That it's getting worse, and that's because of politics. Because the government has been systemically underfunding higher education, mm. um, and we have to try and f fight a positive campaign rather than a negative campaign. We have to say, like, uh, architectural education is important, it's precious, it's special, it's under attack, and we have to start the fight back. So that's, like, a kind of broad brush thing that I bang on about sometimes. But mm. at a more granular level, I think that there's a, there's a big problem with uh, it being very hard for young practices to get meaningful work and young people to get meaningful work. So on the one hand, if you have started your own practice, it is just hard to get jobs. And uh, I think good, bigger practices, and even medium-sized practices, who actively try and pass work to um, younger, uh, more emerging um, companies should be celebrated. And there's um, some practices who do this a lot, and they're really respected within the profession for that that role that they play, which is a, um, a kind of it's a kind of patronage. Yeah. Um, but I think when it's done with the intention of of bringing forward a new generation, rather than done from a position of like passing work to your mates or to your mates' kids or whatever, then it is absolutely something we should celebrate, uh, and possibly we should be a bit more public about how we do that. Um, and then the other thing, so that, that's how to, uh, what big practices can do to help small practices. But the other thing is what can practices do to help their own staff? Mm. Because there are so many young practice, so, so many young architects um, who the only reason they start a practice is because they are quite downtrodden within a larger practice. They don't feel like they can um, express themselves or learn very much or, or kind of uh, have a, a very fulfilling job stuck within this bigger firm. And that is ridiculous because architecture is uh, an extraordinary, broad, um, human thing to be involved in. And the, the fact that there are people stuck in big practices who just feel completely atomized and completely removed from that, that rich, rich culture um, should be a, like deeply embarrassing, not only for the companies that are kind of making their staff do that labor, but also for like us as a profession. Like it should be a kind of um, <laughs> a heavy burden of shame that we're trying to address. Mm. And I do think there's there's uh, coming back to architectural education. There's some teachers who their approach is very much about. Um, training people to be to run practices they you know the, the 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 dream graduate is someone who very quickly starts their own company maybe creates some jobs with a sort of puff of magic and a few contacts <laughs> and uh and off they go and they're, and they're sort of independent what we never really talk about is how to be um a brilliant practitioner who's working for someone else um and in a way that's that's the bread and butter of the profession is, uh, at least in London it is, is people who work for big companies um, or who are the sort of foot soldiers of medium companies. And I would like the AF and I would like architectural culture more generally to pay a bit more attention to those people because they are the people who are um, making all these buildings ultimately. It's not Simon Alford, it's the 400 people who work for Simon Alford. Uh, and if they're not feeling like the joy of a true architectural career, um, then we're not trying hard enough as a, as a profession to make sure that everybody who is feeding into this weird, wonderful beast called architecture is, is, is getting, getting something back from, mm. from that. Um, yeah. That, that's really, really very quite deep, actually. Yeah. A, a deep, a deep <laughs> observation about the about the profession, and um, it hits upon a number of a number of things about, particularly uh, the state of the profession in many ways, 
you know, we have a lot of young architectural practices or young businesses that start out of a reaction, as you say, as being dis disgruntled employees in a large practice where the work has become unfulfilling. And the initial sort of solution to that dissatisfaction in, in job is to go and start your own practice mm. in a business. Mm. And then what happens is that because it's come out of a reaction um, and you're entering into an oversaturated market and there is no sort of entrepreneurial or business education anywhere in, our ed in, anywhere in the architectural education generally, um, and then you end up starting a business and you start a business where you, it's residential projects first and, and then it becomes very hard. It becomes very, very difficult and mm -hmm. a lot of practices are not operating very well um, the struggles become even more intensified. The hours become more intensified. The pay becomes erratic. And also clients then end up getting served not as well as they could be. And it kind of uh, it starts, to, it starts to rock the whole industry in a way. Yes. So, yes. So that's, that's, yeah, that, that's, yeah. that's kind of... Uh, Processing. A, 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 a something that kind of happens. And... Also in architectural education, uh, I, do f I do feel that there is so many architects that perhaps don't necessarily need to be architects as well. And that the breadth of the education that we get is also very applicable to lots of many different industries and ideas. And that there is um, a different form of, you know, kind of self-expression for architects that they could find themselves being very, very happy and making money or doing businesses or running kind of other ventures outside of the industry. So what are your, what are your thoughts on that? That's quite a sort of long... Um, well, I, I didn't know, I didn't know, before I studied architecture, I was a trustee of a, a, a charity that did youth work. Um, and we employed staff, we had 25 staff um, around the country. Uh, and as a trustee, you're, you're kind of the employer effectively. Um, Obviously, there are staff making day-to-day -day decisions. And we would always be excited if we got an application from someone who'd studied architecture mm. because it's a really good grounding for almost anything. And I think that's partly why I'm so um, defensive of it as a, a kind of a, as, a, as a general education, actually, yeah. as well as um, an architectural education. Um, so absolutely, this idea that studying architecture has to be a route to practicing a, as an architect is a slightly silly idea. And I saw, um, what's his name? Alan Jones, the new Reva president, yeah. tweeting the other day. He was like, you know, only, only two out of three people who start part one end up qualifying as a, a part three. Um, could we do better? And I was thinking, that's, that's already quite high. That's like a third of people who start this course end up doing that one thing, being a practicing architect. Like, imagine if a third of people who studied English literature became novelists. That would be an absurdly high proportion. So I'm, I'm not at all worried by the fact that a lot of people are clearly taking something from architectural education and doing something else with it than architecture. I mean, I am a failed architect. I studied architecture. I don't practice as an architect. Mm. Um, I'm still very much in the industry, but there are plenty of other people who studied with me who now do completely different things. And um, I want to like slap them on the back and like buy them a beer because good for them. Like to not, despite this kind of overwhelming pressure from people like Alan Jones and frankly our own teachers saying if you drop out of this three part program, then you're somehow a failure. Mm. Despite all of that, they were like, yeah, actually, you know, I'm going to go off and make my woodworking business and get my 50,000 Instagram followers and have a, a perfectly lovely life making like exquisite handcrafted bowls. Great. Good for you. Um, <laughs> so th there's that. And then I guess the other thing is this. You, you said rightly, I think that a lot of people um, start practices because they're reacting to something that they're dissatisfied with. And... I want to like pick up on that slightly because um, 
partly what they're dissatisfied with is that they're not getting a good enough experience of the capitalist form of practice, right? The kind of what we're sold as like the dream version of architectural work. Um, but partly what they're reacting to, I think, is just architectural work. Like the, the even starting your own practice still means you are delivering a service to fee paying clients who have an economic project that they want your help with. And I think at some point we have to recognize that part of our dissatisfaction is not necessarily these big companies that are employing us, but it is the whole edifice of the kind of late capitalist work ethic and this way that we derive meaning for our, our lives through, um, through delivering economic growth, whether that's economic growth for the nation um, or an economic growth for uh, a private client or for your company, whatever. We've kind of pinned so much of what uh, we tell each other ma makes life worth living on our jobs. And um, I don't think there are many jobs left in the kind of late capitalist economy that can live up to that. Mm. Clearly some can. The entertainment industry has maybe some jobs that are kind of constantly diverse and stimulating and life affirming and yet exist within a very capitalist framework. But I'm not sure architecture has kind of got what it takes mm. to uh, to make life worth living um, <laughs> within this capitalist system. And so that's why I'm actually getting quite critical of wider political uh, trends. And there's it's, it's quite hard to know what to do about that as as an architect because you know we we have our our power is very limited um, uh, and constrained with it uh, within not only the kind of microeconomic situation of the job that we happen to be working in but in the macroeconomic consensus mm. um, and that is partly why with the Oslo Triennale we're we're trying to talk about degrowth, which is this sort of very big idea that a, a good economy might be one that's actually shrinking rather than growing all the time. Um, but I, I, I do think that we should be careful not to start from the position of assuming that there is a perfect version of capitalism where we can be fulfilled and happy and prosperous because there never has been and there probably never will be. We mm. can kind of meddle with it and we can certainly make a, a more ethical version of capitalism than the one we currently have. Um, but it's never gonna do everything that we want it to. Mm. And like, we have to just be aware of that tension and then make our kind of mind up as kind of individual political actors about what that means. And, and what do you see your role in what you do at the Architecture Foundation as a critic in kind of uh, facilitating architecture and the industry and dealing with some of these things that we've just been uh, discussing? So my, the, well, the, I work, I'm Deputy Director of the Architecture Foundation and our, our role, um, we're kind of making it up as we go along a little bit. Uh, we sort of inherited this organization, Ellis Woodman and I, when we started about three years ago. Uh, and we have, we have a few sort of key missions that we're trying to do. One of those is to support younger architects, particularly uh, you know, people at the start of their careers who um, are struggling to get jobs, but who we believe have a wealth of ideas and a wealth of skills that are being squandered. Mm. And we sort of reckon that society would be slightly better if these people who are currently on the margins were able to flourish a bit more. So by trying to facilitate meaningful, uh, exciting opportunities for emerging architects to, um, to do their thing, essentially, uh, we can not only help them in a very kind of direct, personal way, you know, they, they, they're more able to pay their rent, um, they're, they're like on their way to uh, becoming a sustainable business, um, but we can also help the wider world and London because those people who are currently marginalized will become, uh, w uh, have more power, and mm. that, that would be a good thing. 
Um, another thing we're trying to do is to just broaden the conversation about London. We're, we're a London-focused think tank. You know, we live in London, we work in London. Um, and London is an extraordinary place, but it also uh, has suffered and, and maybe continues to suffer from quite an, a surprisingly narrow idea of architecture and urbanism mm. that is not actually learning the best possible lessons from around the world, that is not enfranchising a diverse uh, mix of people with the best ideas, um, and is not adventurous enough in what it considers possible. Uh, and so when we, we're, we're trying to broaden that conversation, that might, that's lots of different things. Clearly that's younger people having a, a better seat at the table. That's clearly uh, voices from overseas having an impact on our, our discourse and helping us to broaden our horizons. Uh, it's diversity in terms of race. It's diversity in terms of um, gender and feminism. Um, to some extent, it's diversity in terms of older people, and there's a there's a um, there's a real kind of hill after which you kind of disappear off into uh, retirement in in the profession. And we've been trying to bring some of those heroes from yesterday mm. back. Um, uh, you know, we just simply putting on lectures by people who the profession sort of reckons have died, but are in fact still around. And we're building amazing stuff in the 60s and 70s that we are all like drooling over in um, photography books about brutalism and yet never take the time to actually go and talk to the people who were there at the time building these things. Uh, so the, the AF has this, this kind of dual role in, in, in making meaningful opportunities for, um, for y particularly young practitioners, mm. but also trying to improve the discussion about the future of London through urban dialogue. Brilliant. Amazing. I think we've... You done? Yeah, we've just about run out of time. So okay, okay. <laughs> uh, I just want to say a massive thank you. I thoroughly, thoroughly... That's right. We didn't even talk about turncoats. <laughs> <laughs> Let's talk about turncoats. <laughs> Let's have, we, we, can, we can... Yeah, turn, turncoats is the, are, are the debates that you facilitate with Ellis. Is that correct? Uh, with Maria Smith. Oh, Maria Smith. From, from Interabank. Interabank, yeah. yes, right, yes. And you've, done a, you've done a number of those and you've done all sorts of different... Topics and uh, um, you know from from us, I remember seeing one that was about the RBA um, and all sorts of different topics about the profession. So, what what is your agenda with turncoats? Okay, yeah, super briefly, I guess um, we go to panel debates all the time as architects. We're, we're lucky in that we have an industry that has a, a really in active professional discourse. Yeah, but a lot of those panel debates are the same panel debate that you went to the week before. They're they're very kind of dry, they're very polite, people are quite nervous to say anything too, too out there because they, you know, it might get back to a client, it might piss someone off, they might upset a relationship. And, and so we end up kind of spending a huge amount of time and energy kind of chatting in very mild platitudes about actually very important issues. And we wanted to create a, um, a discussion series that could dig a bit deeper. And we kind of realized that the way to do this was to use stand-up comedy and theater to create an atmosphere in the room that didn't invite nervousness, didn't shut down conversation, but did the exact opposite. So with Turncoats, we pick these extraordinary venues. We serve shots of vodka. All phones are sealed away in these silver envelopes. Um, you know, we use dramatic lighting. Uh, we commission professional stand-up comedians uh, <laughs> I have a go at telling some jokes. Like we layer and layer and layer until it no longer feels like a sort of after-work professional panel debate. It feels like this sort of extraordinary night at the theatre. And in that setting, suddenly people can come to life, and uh, you have speakers making arguments that they just would never make if they had exactly the same topic and the same panel at the RIBA. Could you give us an example? Or at the NLA. Well, I can't because the other thing is it's <laughs> all off the record. You have to have things off the record because you, you can't run the risk of... Um, because if things are on the record, people get nervous. That's why we had to hide people's phones because no one wants to have their quotes taken out of context and tweeted um, and then to like lose a gig or, or you know, we, we live in a, a, a slightly censorious time and people are rightly self-censoring because they are anxious. 
Um, so no, I can't tell you <laughs> what is discussed at Turncoats, but I can tell you that uh, it is a way that um, people can really get stuff off their chest and they can enjoy being part of an architectural culture that is bursting with ideas. And I don't think many people enjoy panel debates at the NLA. They maybe found them interesting or useful, um, but to have like a great night out at the same time is, is, a, is a challenge. And so that's what we try and do with Turncoats. Love it. That's brilliant. And what's, what's next? What's next for 2019 for you? Well, uh, we're, we're opening a, a big exhibition on Cork Street um, soon. This is the Architecture Foundation. We've invited 80 architects from around Europe to each contribute a small model. Uh, so if you're in London from like uh, mid-March, um, come to Cork Street, see the show. It, it's called Alternative Histories, and that's going to be quite amazing. And then I am off to Oslo to curate the Oslo Architecture Triennial, um, which is about the architecture of degrowth, um, a bit more sci-fi, we're using kind of art and fiction and, and other kind of performing performance tactics to, to try and make an architectural education that is not just stimulating for your kind of brain and eyes, but can be something that your whole body can experience. So that, that should be a lot of fun if you're in Oslo in like September. <laughs> Brilliant. Excellent. Thank you so much for your time and for being welcome. on the show. Thank you. So that is a wrap. Thank you for listening. The views expressed on this show by my guests do not represent those of the host and I make no representation, promise, guarantee, pledge, warranty, contract bond or commitment except to help you be unstoppable. <laughs>